So good morning. Um, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to, uh, my name is Jeff Siglet, and I'd like to introduce our panelists this morning and get started here. Um, we have Professor Elizabeth, Elizabeth Foley on my left, on the far left there. I don't know about politically on the far left, but on the physical far left. Um, and Sai Prakash, uh, Professor Sai Prakash, and Professor Michael Ramsey right beside me. So we'll start off with uh, Professor Ramsey. Oh, I thought you should start on that. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I'm, 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 I'm ready. <laughs> All right, well, uh, uh, good morning, and uh, thanks to the uh, Constitutional Law Center for, uh, for having me up to, to talk about uh, this amendment. And uh, so let me start with uh, sort of a general sense, I think, of, uh, of where this is all coming from. Uh, I, I note that um, actually uh, four of the amendments that have been proposed uh, at this conference um, are directed at a similar problem, uh, and, and although they come at it from a, a different ways. But um, that, that the similar problem is, um, I think, comes from a sense that uh, Congress um, doesn't play a meaningful role in much um, policy making and lawmaking uh, in, in the modern American system. Um, that the, uh, the locus of lawmaking has shifted uh, to a significant extent um, to the executive branch and to uh, administrative agencies um, with, uh, with Congress for the most part um, playing a much more passive role. And the, the result of this has been uh, a, uh, a strengthening of the executive um, and a shift in the executive's role from um, principally an, uh, one that executes the law, one that implements the policies of Congress, um, to um, the lead policymaking branch. Um, and, and relatedly, um, it, it is, uh, been the, has been the rise of uh, policymaking, lawmaking by um, unelected and, and to some extent uh, unaccountable uh, bureaucrats um, rather than um, the, uh, the Congress uh, envisioned by the founders. And, and I think this is um, bo both, uh, th this phenomenon has been um, widely uh, noted and uh, some people have, are, are more concerned about it than others, um, but I think that um, even those that are uh, supportive of the shift note that it's, it is contrary to the constitutional design, uh, which centers lawmaking in Congress, um, Congress being the key policy-making branch, um, and, and as a result in the constitutional design, um, Congress is hedged by multiple checks, uh, including bicameralism, uh, the presidential veto, uh, and uh, frequent elections for, for members of the House. Um, the, but the, the, uh, the current situation, in fact, is that um, that, that Congress is, uh, is overchecked um, and indeed um, is the, what we see, I think, is a, a situation of congressional atrophy um, where it, it's not clear um, that it even matters uh, what party controls Congress. Um, unless, of course, that party uh, also has a supermajority uh, and controls the presidency. So we had that situation very briefly. Um, in um, 2008 to 2000, or 2009 to 2010. Um, but uh, apart from that, uh, it's difficult to identify a, a time in the recent decades that, that Congress has played um, a very meaningful role. Um, and uh, so that's sort of the general background, I think. And uh, the, the question is um, what to do about it, and is, are there things that um, that we could do through an amendment that would do it, uh, that, that would uh, take this on. Uh, and, and as I said, I think there, there are four uh, different amendments that sort of have, have, are, are being proposed. Uh, you've heard one from yesterday to, um, uh, to uh, limit the, uh, the lawmaking effect of, uh, of administrative agencies. Um, we'll, we're gonna hear two more in addition uh, to mine today. Um, mine, I think, is the most modest of the four. I'm not sure if that's a plus or a minus. Uh, I'll leave that for you to decide. Um, but uh, uh, mine is modest in part because um, I, I do accept the, uh, the need to some extent for uh, executive and administrative uh, policy making in the modern uh, 
in, in the modern state and in, in the modern world, I, I, am, uh, I am persuaded to some extent uh, by the arguments of people like uh, Eric Posner and Adrian Vermeule in their book about executive power um, that uh, it, it, it's really not practical um, to have Congress making uh, every, uh, every policy making decision at some level um, of, of delegation to the administrative state um, is, is probably necessary and, and needs to be accommodated. Um, but so that, that, for that's the reason for, uh, I think, the modesty of it, of, of the proposal. But at the same time, I think the, uh, what this addresses, what my proposal addresses is the central, uh, is a central problem of this, is there's no meaningful check on uh, the executive uh, or the administrative agencies. And so rather than trying to limit, it, limit the ability of Congress to delegate um, or of the executive uh, and administrative agencies to make policy, uh, what, what I'm trying to do is, is to provide um, that meaningful check. And, and, and the way that my proposal does that um, is it, um, it reestablishes um, the, uh, the legislative veto uh, in, in bicameral form, but in, in other respects uh, similar to the legislative veto um, as it existed uh, prior to the uh, Supreme Court's decision in uh, INS versus Chadha. Um, a decision which I think was correct as a matter of the, uh, the, the text and original understanding of the Constitution, but I think is, as a policy matter, uh, is, uh, is not uh, advantageous in the modern world. Um, so uh, the mechanics of this are basically, uh, we, would, we, we would allow uh, a, a majority vote by both houses of Congress um, to um, override uh, any executive uh, or administrative uh, rule or policy um, that affects the rights and duties of, uh, of people in the United States. I phrased it that way um, because I wanted to be sure to exclude uh, questions of internal executive branch policy, including personnel, which I expressly call out to, to exclude. Uh, and I also wanted to exclude matters of foreign affairs, where I think it's uh, um, where the president has significant independent power. Uh, and in thinking about uh, a congressional check on presidential independent power, I think is, is a separate project uh, from what I have in mind here. Um, but in other respects, um, really what it does is it removes a presidential veto uh, on, uh, on congressional um, uh, override of, of presidential policies. Um, and then it also, um, in brackets, because I don't think this is a, an essential part of the proposal, but I, I think it's something very much worth thinking about, um, it also um, negates the filibuster. Uh, and I think the, the, the modern filibuster, is the filibuster in its current uh, form, um, is, is a significant problem in the, the broader atrophy of Congress. Uh, and so I, I want to, um, again, in, in keeping with the theme of modesty, a modest swing uh, at, the, uh, at the filibuster here. But, but to, to signal that, that the filibuster is, a, I think, a structural problem uh, with the role of Congress, and if we uh, would exclude a filibuster and, and related um, procedural barriers, um, just have straight majority vote in Congress um, if Congress thinks um, that uh, policies that are adopted by the executive or the administrative branches um, are, um, uh, are inappropriate. Uh, so um, is, this, uh, is this too modest? Um, it, it would, <clears throat> arguably it would uh, only have its uh, significant effect uh, when both houses of Congress are controlled um, by the opposition party to the president. Um, that's indeed when it would have its most bite. Uh, and in fact, but in fact, that's a, uh, that's a significant amount of time that that happens. That's, that's not an uncommon uh, result at all. And it is a situation where Congress's view is most likely to diverge from the president's. But I also think that um, even when the both houses are not controlled by the, the opposition party, uh, what this uh, amendment does is, is it puts Congress um, on, uh, in the spotlight, uh, on the, uh, um, accountable for things that the president and, and the administrative agencies are doing. That doesn't necessarily mean that Congress will oppose them, but what it means is um, that Congress has to take ownership to some extent, in a way that it doesn't have to uh, today, because today it can say, um, oh, well, we didn't bother to do anything about this because uh, we knew the president would veto. We didn't bother to do anything about this because we knew it would be filibustered uh, in the Senate. Um, but those excuses um, would be uh, put aside under this amendment, and now Congress would directly have to say, uh, well, that, um, that administrative um, policy, um, we were behind it. And that's why we haven't done anything. And so I don't think it's necessarily the case um, that uh, we would have to have 
uh, large numbers of policies overridden, uh, so much as to say, Congress, you need to, um, to take responsibility. And, and so I, I would think, um, sort of in, in, uh, in, in closing, um, I think I see this as part of a, of a broader fix, um, that uh, there are other things that could be done and in, co in conjunction with this and should be done, um, but with a part of a larger project um, to reinvigorate Congress um, and, and make Congress again uh, the, uh, the, the locus of policy making, of, of law making, um, and, and to make Congress uh, a, a responsible uh, organization um, and to give it, give Congress a sense um, that it controls um, policy making, that, and that it needs to take responsibility and that it can take responsibility. And I think the problem is, again, going back to the idea of congressional atrophy, is that, um, that Congress has lost its sense of mission. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that, at, at least in part, uh, this would be a step towards res restoring Congress's idea of, of its mission as controlling the policy making uh, of the country. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Now we have comments from Professor uh, Thomas. Uh, since I didn't properly thank uh, Michael McConnell yesterday at the panel, I want to take the chance to do it uh, today um, and thank him for a wonderful conference and to all those who uh, are helping organize it. Um, so I, I applaud Michael's amendment um, generally. I think it's, I, I like that it uh, in some sense tries to functionally recognize the delegation of power, but then tries to formally uh, rein that delegation in uh, really by reinvigorating the legislative veto. Along those lines, I have um, sort of one larger question and three uh, points that I'd like to make that maybe would be uh, clarif uh, clarifying in terms of the amendment itself. And the larger question is you, you take Chadha to be rightly decided. And rereading Chadha um, for, for, to make my comments, I wonder if it really was. I mean, if, I mean it's an odd opinion when you reread it. And it bears all the hallmarks of having been written by Chief Justice Berger. Um, it, it's this, it's this uh, formalist veneer over a kind of functionalist argument, right? And it, it's, it's odd because it says that if the executive is doing something, it's got to be executive power. And so given that it's got to be executive power, right, it doesn't really recognize that there was potentially, a, almost certainly, a legislative delegation. Uh, and I think that if we recognize that, that raises this question is, is the delegation, in fact, a constitutional delegation? And Berger, kind of being Berger, sort of skips over um, that point altogether. And I, and I want to raise the issue because I think, in, in a way, it gets to a question that I'm surprised we haven't talked about as much here, and that is, what is a constitutional amendment in the first place? Um, for a lot of, uh, you know, a, a, a conference on the big fix, a lot of these are and smaller fixes, it seems to me. I mean, this one seems a potential correction of a Supreme Court opinion, which Michael thinks was rightly decided, but now in the modern age, um, recognizing uh, the administrative state, we need to rein congressional power in, and that, and that part, excuse me, rein uh, agency power in and, and agency rulemaking in, and that part um, I applaud. But again, it, I, think, I think the question of is this just uh, you know, a small point overturning Chada. Could this be? Uh, I mean, is Chada problematic on its own terms? I mean, those are those are questions um, we should address. And I would say that if we think of the the formal argument for separation of powers, if the legislature has delegated its authority to an agency, then it seems obvious that it could put conditions on that agency. That that. Congress could say that we're going to check you by way of a legislative veto. And, and one of the things I'd like to ask then in terms of thinking about the amendment that Michael proposes is should he confront the delegation doctrine or non-delegation doctrine as, as he would really have it earlier, square, you know, head on. Should there be a line that says that Congress now has the constitutional authority to delegate its power? And when it delegates legislative power to an agency, then it gets to set the terms of 
that delegation. So it can make the agency clear its rule making. When it's engaged in legislative power, it can, it can make the agency return to Congress. And there, I, and there I also ask, why not then a single house vote on this as the original legislative veto um, was exercised, because that seems consistent with the separation of powers. I mean, if it's a congressional delegation, and Congress has said, okay, we're going to delegate our power to an agency, if one house wouldn't agree, then as part of the lawmaking power, that rule could never have gotten by. So a one house veto seems perfectly consistent here, and would probably strengthen uh, the amendment in terms of reigning in uh, the problem of delegated power and uh, the administrative state in that regard. And then one just last uh, small point as well, why the limiting it to rights, as I read it, or, or duties? Why not a period after, I think it's Congress, I can't altogether see it there, because Congress should be able to make that judgment, right? I mean, if, if, if Congress has delegated its authority, and one house says that we don't like how this agency is using it, that, would, I, that seems to me to place the burden on members of Congress, which is the part of your uh, amendment I applaud the most, and then they can take the initiative and they can alter that rulemaking and do it by um, one house. So those, are, those would be my three changes, which I think are in the spirit of it, but uh, I think may, may make uh, the amendment more powerful in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have Professor Sai Prakash. Thank you. Um, well, um, I, constitutional change doesn't scare me. I think the earth belongs to the living, not to Madison, not to William Brennan, and not to Earl Warren. We've had plenty, const, plenty of constitutional change. It just hasn't been textual change. Why one would favor radical doctrinal change but oppose textual changes is something of a mystery to me. So I say bring on the Convention of States, and I'm sure we will pass Mary Ann Case's Equal Rights Amendment uh, at the Convention of States. Um, my proposal deals with the budget, and along with Amy Wax and Whitney Houston, I believe the children are our future. <laughs> this is not a balanced budget amendment. It is a stop saddling our children with our debts amendment. Um, we are taking actions that keep our children trapped in a virtual de debtor's prison paying for our tax cuts and spending. So as you know, we have debts and deficits as far as the eye can see. Uh, as of May 5th, 2017, the official debt of the US government was $19.8 trillion. That leaves out the future promises we've, we've made to ourselves to spend more money uh, on ourselves. Last year, we had a deficit of $587 billion, more than 3% of our GDP. That number and that percentage, I think, are only going to go up uh, over the next 10 years, at least according to the Congressional Budget Office. To me, these are sobering statistics. What's the cause? Well, uh, we have too little revenue and too much spending, right? That's the, that's the definition of a deficit. I think um, the last time we had a surplus was in 2001. Um, that gave way in, in, in a recession. For the past several decades, federal revenues have hovered between 15 and 20 percent of GDP and federal spending from 19 to 27 percent. Um, when you break down the causes further, you see a proliferation of uh, tax breaks designed to prod and poke us into adopting certain behaviors, like buying mansions and electric cars. And then, of course, one can't help but mention the entitlement portion of the federal government's budget. 66% of our annual spending is on entitlements. Um, those entitlement programs are on automatic pilot, meaning um, they continue on forever. Uh, unless new legislation is enacted. And so the, the annual budget process that we read about is only about 33% of the budget. The rest of the spending comes from programs that were enacted in the past, and, and um, Congress isn't revisiting those programs on an annualized basis. Um, but, you know, those entitlements are really the sort of sacred cows or the third rail of the federal government. They just aren't touched. Um, now, you know, I, I view this as a disease of sorts, right? The inability of the federal government to um, run surpluses in times of economic expansion. We kind of understand why you might need to run a deficit in times of economic contraction, but the inability to run a surplus um, during times of economic growth, I think, is a, is a, is a fundamental problem. And um, the difficulty is somewhat masked by the low interest rate environment that we have now. Um, for every uh, 
increase in the interest rate by one, one point, it, it adds $145 billion to our deficit. So, it, you know, the, the interest payments aren't so large now in part because interest rates are, sorry, the interest payments on the existing debt aren't so large in part because our interest rates are so low, but there's no reason to think that's going to continue indefinitely. So I proposed this, you know, protect our children amendment. <laughs> and the goal uh, in Section 1 is a balanced budget every year. That's the bow ideal of the amendment. Um, there's sort of three forms of slack in it. First, um, I, I acknowledge that maybe in wartime it's okay to have some deficit spending. Um, I also acknowledge that during a recession, uh, maybe it's okay to have some deficit spending. Um, and then the third, uh, the third form of slack, I, I'd say, is the form of the sanction. My sanction um, is that incumbents aren't eligible to serve um, if, they, you know, if they help to bring into being a deficit the previous fiscal year. Uh, but the ineligibility sanction only kicks in when the deficit is above $100 billion, meaning if they, you know, they get a $90 billion deficit, they can run again. If they, they get $100 billion or more, they, they can't. Um, this is no small fig figure at $100 billion is a, is a lot of money to, to most of us, I dare say. Um, I chose it because I didn't want anyone to claim that some random event generated uh, a deficit and then caused members of Congress to get kicked out of office. Um, why this sort of enforcement mechanism? Um, some state, lots of states have balanced budget amendments or balanced budget provisions. I think about 40 do. Some of them don't actually have a provision specifying how, um, how there's going to be enforcement of the, of, of the amendment. And you know, some executives, some governors have just assumed that they have the authority to reduce spending or increase taxes to get the budget into balance. I didn't want to give the executive any sort of authority here. I wanted um, Congress uh, to take responsibility for it. I don't want Congress to pass a budget with a budget deficit and then blame some third party for having to cut spending or raise taxes, right? We, we, get, we passed a good budget and then this other fellow um, is, is imposing the pain on the rest of us. I think Congress should have to uh, feel the pain. And so that's why the pain is in the form of Congress, members of Congress not being able uh, uh, to run again. Um, and I, I agree with David Mayhew, who says that for members of Congress, the most important thing in life is not, you know, uh, their children or anything else. It's just getting reelected. <laughs> and if you can you know, tell them that they might not get reelected, that will focus their attention in a way that nothing else can. Um, as far as the judiciary playing a role, um, I, I'm in favor of systematically refashioning the federal judiciary and its role in our constitutional defense, but in the absence of knowing the contours of any such change, I thought it was fine to rely upon judicial review. Um, and then finally, why is there a 10-year delay in the effective date of the amendment? Well, as I learned in Western Civ here at Stanford, uh, the great Augustine in his confessions prayed to God to make, quote, make me chase, but not yet. <laughs> and um, I think members of Congress are more likely to favor an amendment that has no immediate effects. Um, they can be res fiscally responsible later, and that's fine with me, right? I, there's a, you know, it's obviously better to deal with a problem sooner rather than later, but it's better to have a solution than to not have a solution because people um, are afraid of its immediate effects. So what's left out? Um, there's no notion of any sort of capital budget in, in, in this document. Um, I know that some states uh, separate out capital spending from non-capital uh, non spending. Um, there's no discussion of retiring the existing debt that we have in the proposal. Um, uh, there's also no discussion of how one would get a balanced budget, right? I, I don't, doesn't talk about spending, it doesn't talk about taxes. Um, unlike uh, Michael's proposal from yesterday, I, you know, I, don't, I don't have a position on whether it should be higher taxes or spending cuts. It's certainly not in the amendment. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I'll, I'll have two, just two final things to say. Um, I don't know if the balanced budget amendment is politically conservative. I mean, if 40 states have some kind of balanced budget provision, it suggests that both Democrats and Republicans can see the, the wisdom of it. And since we have states with, I think, radically different levels of spending, welfare spending or otherwise, I think it's consistent with high levels of spending or low levels of spending. And as we saw yesterday, you know, some people will think that the balanced budget amendment will mean that Entitlement spending will be gutted, and other people think it'll be, or taxes will be raised. We just don't know what will happen, right? And so I don't think we can say um, just off the top of our heads what we can expect if a balanced budget amendment applies. And then finally, you know, I had the pleasure of meeting Senator Feingold um, yesterday, and uh, he told me that you know, the balanced budget amendment had come up a couple of times when he was uh, in Congress. 
And I, I think he told me this, but if he didn't, I looked it up. Um, you know, there was an uh, amendment in 1997 that was before the Senate. It failed by one vote. Senator Feingold was the deciding vote, along with the other 30, 32 senators who voted against it. So I want to give the chance to redeem, Senator, a chance to redeem his fiscal soul. <laughs> <laughs> and now we'll hear from uh, Professor Feingold, uh, who will redeem his soul. <laughs> <laughs> First, I want to thank Professor McConnell. I, I think this overall subject is one of those things that you're going to see 24-7 uh, on CNN in a couple of years because of the growing movement that's going on for constitutional convention. I happen to oppose it, but I think it's a very good idea for people to grapple with this and to think about it uh, well in advance of, of something like that happening. And Professor, I, you know, I thought one of the consolation prizes of not being in politics that I wouldn't have to fend off the balanced budget amendment anymore. <laughs> but here I am, uh, and uh, I recognize you're saying it's not a balanced budget amendment, but my view is if it walks like a balanced budget amendment and talks like a balanced budget amendment, it's probably a balanced budget amendment. But I give you credit for it being a, a little different from the one that you were talking about in the 1990s, which did mispassing by almost one or two votes a couple of times. Uh, this one actually has uh, an interesting, truly unique enforcement mechanism, the political death penalty uh, for <laughs> members of Congress. And of course, there are classic arguments that, that wouldn't surprise you uh, uh, to, to question this. One is the nature of the exceptions, the idea of a significant <laughs> war exception. It's got a lot of problems. Congress hasn't declared a war since World War II. Uh, what is a significant war? Is what we're doing in Yemen a significant war? What about ISIS? I think most people would call it a significant war, but there hasn't been any declaration whatsoever uh, by Congress with regard to that. Uh, what about the fact that people talk about the war on terror? I think most people would say we've been fighting the war on terror th since 2001. That means your amendment wouldn't have applied for the last 17 years uh, if that is to be deemed a significant war. In fact, there's even incentive here for members of Congress to declare a significant war because then <laughs> they don't have to worry about getting thrown out. So I have a problem with that. The second is obviously it's a little bit um, under-inclusive with regard to other possible problems that could come up. I mean, you can say Katrina, but may, uh, type of catastrophe, uh, an Ebola virus catastrophe that isn't covered, I don't think, by this amendment. Uh, even the possibility of somebody detonating a dirty bomb, let's say, in the big city that wouldn't necessarily be connected with some war. All of these things uh, would, would cause this, uh, would not be covered under this amendment. I am concerned, it's sort of a classical argument, but with regard to your mechanism, tying up the courts with this kind of determination, I think it violates the separation of powers in a significant way for the courts to be making these kind of budget determinations. Uh, presumably relying on the Congressional Budget Office when you already have an environment where a health care bill is going through that has no CBO estimate and, and the Republicans are saying, well, the CBO is worthless anyway. And then you throw it into the hands of the, of the courts. Um, I mean, just think about 2007 versus 2008. How could people have anticipated the economic collapse? And, and, and is it really a good idea when those estimates are so different a year later because of economic collapse? Is it a good remedy to simply throw out all the members of Congress who you, you could argue did not necessarily uh, cause that? Uh, I don't have time to get into the capital budgeting thing. I think that's an important piece. But those are all the sort of classical arguments. Let me take the remaining time to talk about what I, I actually am more concerned about. And it's based how the budgeting really operates in Congress. The first thing I want to say is it hasn't always been the case that this doesn't work. When President Clinton came in and, and the Contract with America crowd came in, we had what I called an unfriendly competition to get rid of the deficit. And you acknowledged it. It was gone by 2001. There was a constant discussion about, uh, by both parties, finding it politically very popular to talk about balancing the budget and doing it without a constitutional amendment. I found that process to be exciting with regard to constituents suggesting ideas, well, why don't you cut this, why don't you get rid of that? But of course, it required that you were willing to both not have new tax cuts, as well as trying to prevent the Democrats from always justifying spending and saying what we need is cut taxes for the rich. But that dynamic did work, and it was only when, uh, in my view, 
President Bush came in, had huge taxes, particularly for upper income people, an unfunded war in Iraq, an unfunded Medicare Part D, and all of a sudden we're back in deficit. But the fact is, it had worked without a constitutional amendment. The second is, um, you know, we've lost the, the congressional process of the regular order to deal with budgetary matters. When I first came to the Senate in 1993, we took up each appropriations bill separately. You were allowed the time you wanted to offer amendments to get rid of things as well as add things. And we didn't have this sort of omnibus bill at the end of the year where you had a gun to your head and you didn't get to read the bill. All of that has been lost, and it is not necessary to have a constitutional amendment to restore that. I think it needs to, to be done. Uh, finally, and this is probably what concerns me the most, having gone through this. What you're going to do is throw out the good guys uh, with the bad guys. Uh, throwing out the baby with the bathwater, throwing out the, the good senator with the swamp water. Uh, you know, I made a, a real effort, and many senators on both sides, to identify programs that didn't make sense. You know, the tea, tea tasting board, the wool and mohair subsidy from the 1940s that was uh, so that our soldiers could have wool when they went to Iraq, wool outfits, it, it still exists. Uh, we have a medical school in Maryland that the federal government runs that is, you know, simply not uh, budget efficient. It's not necessary to have that kind of thing. What you're doing by this, by creating this death penalty, is giving nobody an incentive to sort of get in there, roll up their sleeves, and identify those things. What you're doing is saying, look, uh, you're going to be out either way based on these estimates. And so I think what you're doing is returning to the main use of the balanced budget amendment today, which is a political tool used by candidates for office who don't want to tell you what they would actually cut. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next, we have Professor Foley. Thanks. Um, it, it's interesting that uh, Mike and I ended up on the same panel because I think uh, you know you would think we had compared notes uh, before this conference, but we hadn't. But um, so not only was I surprised to see Mike's uh, proposal about non-delegation, but uh, as he noted, there are two other people uh, in the conference who also have similar ideas. Um, Will Howell has a. Uh, proposal that I'm going to comment on later today, I think tries to address the same basic problem. Um, and uh, Michael Toth yesterday also um, had sort of a unique and uh, um, a, a little bit unusual but quite creative approach to, to, to the issue. And I think the issue that we're all identifying is sort of a, an, an erosion of congressional vigor uh, and how to sort of re-inject uh, uh, some energy into what Congress does or some interest in uh, their constitutional prerogatives. Uh, and I think the erosion of, of Congress's uh, vigor is based upon a, a couple of different uh, phenomena. One is that, that Congress has surprisingly uh, willingly ceded its own power uh, over the years to the other branches, mostly, I think, the executive branch, uh, and I think it's done so for purposes of uh, political expediency. Um, and the other phenomenon is that Congress um, has increasingly um, been experiencing gridlock, uh, I think because we are, as a society, increasingly politically polarized. And um, there's some relationship between these two phenomena, of course. Um, congressional gridlock, for example, tends to uh, fuel a transfer of power to the executive because uh, if you're an aggressive executive anyway, you can often find sort of capacious language uh, within a statute uh, and use that language as sort of a statutory hook upon which to base um, significant new policies, usually accomplished through notice and comment rulemaking, but not necessarily. We saw a lot of significant policy making, I think, in the Obama administration by things as simple as a memo. Uh, sometimes on just posting something on a website had significant reverberations. Uh, so I think the Obama administration's um, uh, uh, policies with regard to the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act are, are prime examples of, of, of that particular phenomenon. Um, and then I also think that congressional gridlock also um, convinces a more aggressive executive to sort of take action that can even contradict um, statutory language, which I think was the boldest move of all that we've seen in recent years. And they do this by employing sort of a broad conception of prosecutorial or, or executive discretion uh, to prioritize limited resources and where they're going to spend uh, their money. Uh, I think the prime example of that would be uh, the Obama administration's policies uh, regarding immigration, the DACA and DAPA 
um, things, whatever you want to call them, policies. Um, but even when there isn't any gridlock at all in Congress, and Congress actually manages to pass something, which does occasionally happen, um, I think Congress is finding it just far too easy uh, these days to sort of punt uh, difficult issues to the other branches, again, particularly the executive branch. Uh, I, I saw this phenomenon uh, way too often myself when I worked on the Hill, uh, and what I saw was that rather than wrestling with uh, difficult problems and sort of finding a compromise, all too often Congress sort of knowingly wrote statutes that were ambiguous um, with the purpose, frankly, of uh, punting uh, these difficult issues to either the courts or to the administrative agencies for resolution by rulemaking. Um, there were many times when the, the message from the chairman of the committee as it came out of the markup uh, was to draft uh, with purposeful ambiguity so that they could avoid um, getting down to brass tacks and they could actually get something passed so they could uh, reach majoritarian consensus in the chamber. So I think it's, it's just easier these days for Congress to sort of toss these political hot potatoes uh, to others. Um, and while I'm going to talk about Professor Howell's um, proposal uh, a little bit later on, uh, he's mostly concerned, I think, with, with breaking that gridlock, which I think is um, important. I think um, sometimes gridlock needs to be broken, although not always, as you'll see in my comments when I talk about his proposal. Um, and he's trying to, to break that gridlock by trying to incentivize Congress um, in, I think, a creative way to, to sort of get things done and pass legislation. But I'm more concerned in my proposal, I mean, one thing that makes us very different is I'm really just concerned with the raw transfer of power. I'm trying to halt the transfer of power um, to the executive branch that's uh, been happening essentially since the turn of the 20th century at least. Uh, and so while uh, Mike considers his proposal to be sort of a modest one, um, I guess on the scale of Modesty minds on the on the far end. It's not really modest at all. It's it's rather aggressive, uh, admittedly admittedly so. Um, in fact, many uh, administrative rules today. If you think about it, uh, it's fascinating to see courts, for example, overtly label um, rules to be quote unquote legislative rules. Um, that's their term, and in my opinion, that's uh, oxymoronic. There's uh, absolutely no uh, textual basis in the Constitution for any such thing as a legislative rule. Uh, Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution, the very first part of the Constitution, vests all legislative power in Congress. Um, so there's absolutely, if you're an originalist and a textualist, uh, you, it's hard to, um, at least as a matter of theory, get on board with the idea of administrative agency lawmaking, no matter how much uh, notice and comment rulemaking uh, might be provided. Uh, it's not a process defect, it's a, it's a substantive problem here. Uh, and I'm not saying, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that other branches can never take some actions that may, around the margins, have some characteristics of lawmaking. Uh, you can see my proposal, as aggressive as it is, is not that rigid. Um, even James Madison in the Federalist Papers, I think it was 47, uh, acknowledged that there was a more flexible approach to separation of powers. Um, although it's weird, I mean, if you look at some of the history, Madison did have a 16th article in his original Bill of Rights proposal, which actually did take a, a rigid approach to separation of powers. But be that as it may, that proposal never made it out of, of the Senate anyway. So uh, he backed on, off on that, I guess, at some point. Um, but I think the key to separation of powers is actually the stuff in Federalist 51. Uh, and that is uh, where Madison is, is talking to the American people about how he is presupposing that in this constitutional architecture that's been created, um, the, each member of, the branch, of each branch is going to sort of je jealously guard their core constitutional prerogatives. Uh, and his language, you, you'll probably recognize it, but I'll just quote him here. He said that ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Uh, and that the interest of the man must be connected to the rights of the place. Uh, and, and I think that that idea has been lost, certainly in Congress. I'm not sure today that we can say that members of Congress jealously um, guard their constitutional prerogatives. There have been rather remarkable times in recent years, I think, when uh, members of Congress, in fact, have applauded uh, aggressive executive action that has undermined congressional lawmaking prerogatives. 
And so while Madison believed that uh, we would have this sort of a connection with our institution and jealously guard uh, the place, so to speak, um, I don't think that's happened. Uh, the legislature has not predominated, or certainly is not today, the way that the founders envisioned. Uh, I don't think Madison, of course, could have foreseen the rise of the modern administrative state, um, the behemoth that it's become. Uh, he certainly couldn't have foreseen the development of uh, Chevron deference, uh, which itself aggrandizes the executive branch at the expense, I think, of, co of Congress. <clears throat> and he certainly couldn't have seen, I think, the, the fascinating phenomenon of Congress sort of willingly ceding all of this power to the administrative state. Um, and I think while most of us could admit that the, that the delegation of, of, of legislative power uh, has reached almost absurd proportions, uh, and it's certainly contrary to the original design of the Constitution, uh, it is 2017, right? It's not 1817, it's not even 1917. Uh, and I think in 2017, growing up when we do, uh, with all of this as a backdrop that we sort of take for granted, um, I think we either um, tend to sort of applaud uh, the growth of the administrative estate uh, and, and their sort of lawmaking function as sort of efficient or maybe even a superior means of um, deciding complex issues um, because I think we are uh, acculturated to sometimes think of administrative agencies as being these, these bodies of experts uh, in a given field uh, who might be better positioned than Congress to craft some of these policies. Uh, I've heard uh, people uh, refer to members of Congress, for example, as just generalists, you know? So we have 535 generalists, uh, I think, which again is sort of, you know, is value-laden, suggesting that they're not really smart enough to figure out some of these complex issues. Uh, whether that's true or not, I'm not gonna comment, but I, you know, I think we could, I think we could push them and they could try a little harder. Um, but I think there's also some people who just don't really care, you know, who makes these rules, as long as the rules are, you know, kind of make general sense and they aren't too onerous. So I think a lot of us are just sort of gotten lazy about this. Um, and then there's the third category I think I fall into, where people uh, who, who sort of condemn the delegation of congressional power. Um, but um, when you do this in polite company, and I think I'm certainly in polite company right now, I think sometimes this position uh, can trigger snorts of derision. Uh, from people because of pragmatic concerns. They'll say, well, it's just too late to sort of put that cat back into the bag uh, and scale back administrative power. And I understand that pragmatism. I'm not a, someone who lacks a pragmatic streak. Um, but um, I, as a sort of delusional originalist, if you will, uh, someone who insists on originalism, uh, I think we ought to at least try to put that cat back into the bag, even if it hurts. Uh, around the margins, because I think it's the right thing to do uh, for the Constitutional Republic. Um, but it's going to be a difficult task, and uh, I think that uh, if we wanted to give this to the courts, this task to the courts, um, it would be uh, uh, an exercise in frustration. So I think if we're really going to do this, the only way to do it is via some form of a constitutional amendment. Uh, you can see that what I've done is, is just trying to make it as sort of as simple as possible by picking a, a dollar amount, uh, be the only part in the Constitution that has a dollar amount other than the Seventh Amendment. Uh, but I tried to uh, prevent the obscurity of the $20 amount of the Seventh Amendment by indexing this puppy to some sort of index, and I just picked one that seemed relatively good. Um, and so uh, uh, the purpose of the amendment basically is to take any rule with major economic effect and say, uh, sorry, administrative agencies, you just can't do it full stop uh, and transfer that power back to Congress where I think it belongs. Well, thank you very much. Now for comments, we have uh, Professor Howell. Well, let me add my voice to the chorus of thanks um, for putting together this conference. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I hope that it does lead to broader conversations in this era of Trump where it's all talk about personality. The, to, if we could get this to take and train our attentions on issues of, in, of institutional and constitutional design, our country would be better for it. Um, I'm also really glad to have a chance to talk about Professor Foley's um, 
proposed amendment, which involves thinking about curtailing a president's capacity to exercise these unilateral powers. Um, uh, so I'll say this is a point of fact, maybe even a point of pride. I'm not a lawyer. I'm a political scientist. Um, and so when I think about these, the motivation, the concern that I have has less to do with concerns about the ways in which delegations of authority from the legislative to the executive branch are out of stepping with that original moment and, and out of keeping with the sensibilities of the founders and their, um, uh, the, in, that, in that original moment, but, but rather in recognition that there are real pathologies that can follow um, when presidents exercise these unilateral powers, that the kind of policy change that we observe tends to be piecemeal in nature, it tends to be precarious, it leads to lots of uncertainty to the extent that an order is issued by one president, it can promptly be undermined by the next and then reasserted by the following, which leads to a number of uh, uh, pathologies, a lack of fiscal discipline you might worry about, a lack of um, representation, that is we don't know who exactly is writing these things and what we might be able to do about them. they are real pathologies associated with the exercise of these powers and so we should be concerned to my mind, not because it's out of keeping with the founder's intent, but because it leads to problematic policy outcomes. Um, so then the question is, what might we do about it? Well, what might we do about it crucially depends, as I see it, on how presidents are likely to respond and what problems might follow. Um, two things. First, why do presidents exercise these powers to begin with? Right? Why, why do they go to such lengths, presidents and, and the administrative state more generally, go to such lengths to issue proclamations and executive orders and national security directives and rulemaking and memoranda and on and on and on and on. Central to this project um, for presidents is an effort to try to attend to the incredible expectations put before them on the one hand by the public. The public expects presidents to do everything um, and the formal powers that are granted are wholly incommensurate with the expectations laid at their doorstep. And so if, if as Mayhew points out, members of Congress are single-minded seekers of re-election, presidents are, if not single-minded seekers of power, then at least primally concerned about power. There's a reason why power flows typically in one direction, why we see Congress delegating to the president, but you don't, we can't point to examples of presidents saying, this one's best left to Congress, right? They claim at every turn whatever power they can find because they're expected to exercise mastery over every conceivable policy domain. There's no domain in which the president gets to say, the executive branch gets to say, yeah, this is above my pay grade. Um, somebody else has to figure out what to do about fill in the blank. Um, they're expected to do everything. And so if what you do is you come in and you institute a rule that says it's trying to, it's trying to short circuit a president's capacity or the administrative state's capacity to exercise these powers, to my mind, what you can expect to see is a lot of ducking and weaving. Um, and it's worth paying attention to what form that might take when we write down a rule. So in the rule that we have before us, we've got this limit on, um, it's going to do away with any, any rules that have the effect of uh, affecting the economy by $100 million. So how would presidents respond to that? The first thing I think you can expect them to do is to monkey with um, what those, how those numbers are generated, right? So there's gonna be a lot of pushback there. Even if we're able to discipline that activity, then we can expect presidents to suddenly issue lots of rules at the $99 million mark, right? And then for those that are gonna go above, above, uh, above $100 million, what we can expect them to do is just split the rules. Right? So where there was one overriding rule that was coming in at $200 million, I'm going to now issue three. And then I'm in the clear. So this is, this is frustrating, but I think it's, it's, it's certainly in keeping with how presidents have responded by past efforts by Congress to establish things like reporting requirements on these unilateral directives, um, limits on uh, particular policy domains and when, when and when they can't um, exercise these things, and also the tremendous creativity that presidents have shown in what constitutes the, the tools available to them when they exercise these unilateral powers. I'm being told to stop. I'm just getting started. Okay, um, <laughs> let me say, uh, let me say, let me say one thing about uh, solving. Um, uh, there's, also, there's this other, this other 
uh, dimension to it, which is there's, there's a way in which this solves actual problems. That I think there are pathologies, but, there, but these powers that are exercised by the administrative state um, are in some ways a response to ambiguity of statutes and unwillingness and incapacity of Congress to meet the challenges put before them, to update statutes that have, put, that, um, that have grown outdated. And so a lot of what presidents are doing are correcting from a policy standpoint what could reasonably be called flaws. So I really quite like the idea of thinking about a, how we might correct unilateral powers and, and curtail them, but putting that into conversation with how we might invigorate the legislative process more generally. And so, which is why I think you and I actually have a one-two punch here, that we, we need to also think about what the legislative process is gonna look like and not just try to short circuit the exercise of these unilateral powers and rulemaking on its own. Well, thank you very much. So I think we have time for about, about uh, 10 minutes of questions or so, or f five to 10 minutes. Oh, we'll do 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so why don't we start on the right here? Thank you very much. My question's for Professor Foley. Why don't you discount benefits from the $100 million? Um, actually, the, the $100 million was just sort of borrowed from the Congressional Review Act. Um, so that's the, the it's tracking uh, the CRA's language. Uh, you know, the problem with the CRA today is that um, it's a statute uh, and it requires a joint resolution of disapproval by Congress of a, re uh, of a regulation. Um, and it was rarely used. I mean, it's been around since, I don't know, the 90s. I, I know that. Uh, it was used one time until this administration. And then at the beginning of the Trump administration, I think it's been used about 17 times uh, at last count. Um, uh, so it's, 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 it's being used more and more often, but I don't like the CRA because, A, it's just a statute and could be repealed uh, at any moment, uh, but also because it does require this um, affirmative joint resolution of disapproval by Congress. Uh, but it uses the exact same $100 million threshold and defined in essentially the same way, which is why I have an enabling clause in my um, proposed amendment so that Congress could basically just um, sort of reenact the CRA but with constitutional authority behind it. Right, but I guess I'm wondering if the if a proposed rule generates, say, fifty million dollars in benefits, then why doesn't that get discounted from the hundred million? dollars? Again, I mean, this is not something that I I put a tremendous amount of thought on. I was just trying to do something in the sense that Congress would be comfortable with this concept. It's already been used. It's been used successfully. So this isn't like a, me making a substantive decision that, oh, benefits aren't worth consideration. Congress had already made that judgment, so I'm just sort of riding on their coattails. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll go to the left now, to Professor Aikoff. So Professor Foley, I think this question is directed mostly to you, but to a greater or lesser extent, it relates to the other, the other members of this panel. Um, so I happen to think, in fact, I've just been writing about this the last two weeks, I don't think Madison cared very much about the separation of powers. I think the, you know, the famous formula from Federalist 51, ambition must be made of Conrad ambition, the interest of man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. I think he tosses it out you know, for largely rhetorical purposes. It is a kind of hypothesis. I think it would be great to hear you know, Russ discuss the extent to which party loyalty versus institutional commitments work in Congress. I don't think it's just that party loyalty trumps everything. Look at the problems the Republicans are going to have with you know, the health, the AHCA or whatever it is, you know, if they ever take it up. But on the more, on the more general point, I just want to read you a kind of famous passage, which I relied on a lot, uh, where Madison discusses the separation of powers in Federalist 37. He says, experience has instructed us that no skill in the science of government has yet been able to discriminate and define with sufficient certainty its three great provinces, the legislative, executive, and judiciary or even the privileges and powers of the different legislative branches. Questions daily occur in the course of practice which prove the obscurity which reigns in these subjects and which puzzles the greatest adepts in political science. And when you go on to read Madison discuss the separation of powers. Yeah, that's this, 47, isn't it? No, thir 37. That's oh, 37. Oh, when he, yeah, but when he goes out, that's 37. When he goes out in 47 and 48 to discuss it, actually 47 through 51, there are two things that are remarkable. One is he says the only way in which we can make sense of this is to do it empirically. So we have to follow Montesquieu, you know, the celebrated Montesquieu, you know, the, you know, Shakespeare's Oracle, um, or, you know, he, or just, you know, forget that. Um, you know, but, you know, we have to figure out what, you know, you know, Montesquieu being French is kind of long on theory and short on observation. So we have to look at the British Constitution and figure out 
what does it actually mean? And then we have to look at the American state constitutions. Uh, and what we discover is actually a remarkable diversity of practice. So that, you know, the concept, you know, you may have some, you know, core definitions of what legislative executive judicial power, which are great as a kind of, I suppose, a first order pass at it. But substantively, uh, there is an enormous range for experimentation. So the idea of, you know, and I, I know your, your amendment actually has a much more specific thrust to it, and I, I'm not going to address that, but the conceptual background seems to be rooted in this concern about, and I think really all these papers, um, about, you know, about separation of powers. And I just think the whole concept for Madison was quite muddy, though it became much more specific in the next decade. The 1790s, when the presidential war power, or you know, let's, say, let's say the federal power comes to the fore, Madison starts, starts to have think, he has to start thinking about it much more seriously. But so, I don't, I don't, I don't know what kind of originalist you are, I know what kind I am, um, but if you want to root this in a kind of late 18th century context, it, it gets much, much fuzzier than one could possibly conceive. Well, I, I, I think yeah. you've got a misimpression. I mean, I, I think I started my remarks by saying that this is not a rigid separation of powers, that there is some flexibility here. I certainly acknowledge that. Um, but I do also believe that there's plenty of political philosophy. It's not just Madison uh, about the importance of separation of powers. It's, it's Locke. It's, it's Montesquieu. It's Blackstone. It's uh, it's, it's English history. Uh, it's the idea that the statute of proclamations in the reign of Henry VIII uh, was the only time in, in recent history that were, that where the monarch himself had the power to unilaterally make law. Uh, now, we can di disagree around the margins of what lawmaking is and try to come up with some definitions for that. I think Justice Thomas has proffered some interesting definitions in the case law. Um, but uh, the idea that separation of powers is important, I don't think, is reasonably debatable from an originalist perspective. And then, of course, you've got the text in Article 1, Section 1, which doesn't just say that the legislative power, it says all legislative power. No, it says the legislative power is here and enumerated. Right, exactly. Well, and, and I'm not just Actually, less than all legislative power. But the point, yeah. the idea that whatever the legislative power is, and I agree that the legislative power is enumerated, so you're not going to get me to disagree on that one, um, is vested in Congress, and only Congress is a matter of text. Well, now that we've heard from the ghost of James Madison, we'll turn to Professor Peel Diesel right here. I have a question for Mike Ramsey and then a, just a very short um, comment to Cy. So uh, I'm curious why you left foreign affairs out of your interesting proposal. Uh, I've thought that uh, one of the major reasons that Congress has disappeared from the uh, engagement with questions of use of military force has to do with the end of the legislative veto because of Chada. Um, I mean, Congress has lots of reasons to want to run away from the responsibility of, of making decisions uh, about use of military force, and that's always going to be present. But there is actually this ongoing problem that we see over and over when Congress in the modern period starts confronting whether to authorize uses of military force, which is uh, if they you know, think about the Gulf of Tonkin situation, which is very present on people's minds in Congress. There's a worry about over, overly general delegations of authority for the use of military force and the way in which presidents will abuse those. On the other hand, you know, if Congress tries to be very, very specific about the particular uses of military force it authorizes, uh, that has all sorts of problems as well because you can't anticipate changing circumstances in war. Um, and the fact that Congress can't kind of claw back any of the authorization, uh, I think, is part of the dynamic as to why it's so paralyzed in trying to figure out, you know, at what level of generality it authorizes military force. So I've thought for a while that this is actually a, a very serious dynamic in the disappearance of Congress in this space. So that's my, my question to you. The small comment to size just builds on what Senator Feingold said. Uh, we have all these ideas about Congress being profligate about spending and irresponsible and all of that. It really seems to be the case that uh, with respect to these budgetary kinds of issues, uh, presidents are the ones who drive the dynamic and Congress is more responsive to presidents. So when presidents want to reduce taxes, do massive infrastructure, maybe engage in you know, expensive military ventures overseas, for the most part, Congress tends to go along when you have a president who is elected on an agenda or decides to adopt an agenda of 
you know, trying to rein in the financial uh, position of the United States, Congress has been fairly responsive to that as well. So I actually think that these, this dynamic is more driven by presidential uh, commitments than the way we sort of tend to talk about it with the focus on Congress. It doesn't change your amendment at all, it's just an observation. Um, so, you know, a lot, of, a lot of state balanced budget provisions talk about the executive proposing a balanced budget, and I just thought, I, I didn't think that mattered. I think you might be right that presidents have legislative agendas that involve reducing revenues or raising spending, and that Congress often acts on those agendas. But I don't know why the, act, the, the, the decision to act upon them means that Congress can't do something else to offset the, you know, the revenue declines or the spending increases, right? So it's not like the president is typically not saying, I want a tax cut and I don't want spending cuts as well. And the, or the president's not saying, I'm, in, I'm insisting on new spending, but don't raise taxes, right? So I mean, ultimately, all these decisions are left to Congress by the Constitution. No one, you know, whatever the president proposes, just as, you know, it's often said to be dead on arrival when it gets to Congress. So I think you're right that the president um, has some sway over Congress in terms of getting them to enact new programs. And all the, all the amendment would do is require them to make some sort of offset for taking into account his legislative preferences should they choose to act upon it. Um, yeah, well, and thanks for the question on, on foreign affairs. Uh, the, the reason I excluded foreign affairs is because uh, I think the Constitution assigns uh, some significant independent power to the president in, in foreign affairs. I'll get to the war power point in a second. Uh, I, I, so, um, and, and I think that there's, there's a reason for that is that, um, that, that we want to have um, uh, a, a more consistent um, uh, and responsive uh, uh, policy directed through the executive in foreign affairs, more so um, than in domestic affairs. And the domestic affairs is really where um, we, we expect Congress to play um, the, the most significant role. So that's why um, the uh, that's why the, the amendment is, is focused that way. Although I will say this, it, it's not a it's not a blanket foreign affairs exception. It's, it, it's anything that's that's entirely outside the United States is is outside the amendment. But um, there there are lots of things that have foreign affairs implications that would be taken up by the amendment because they have domestic policy um, a, a, as well. But I I guess I think where where the, the the real pathology that we're seeing is the uh, um, the uh, the retreat of Congress from. Um, from domestic policy making, whereas the, the foreign affairs I, I see as a somewhat different category. War powers, though, I think is a separate category within foreign affairs because I, I agree with the, uh, um, the uh, premise of the question, uh, which is that Congress properly has a central role uh, in, in deciding whether to, uh, um, to put the country in a, in, in a war situation. And uh, uh, so I, I agree with that premise, but um, I, I think that it's not, um, I, I think that sort of requires a separate fix in a sense that, um, because I think that um, the, situ the, the difficulty in war powers is typically not um, that, con that we get into a war and then Congress wants to pull us out. I think once, once we're in a war, we're sort of in one and, and it, I'm not sure that you would have a dynamic where Congress would be, um, be anxious to, um, to pull us out. And, and indeed, I think if Congress really wanted to, probably this is one place where budgeting uh, is a way that um, that Congress could could if it wanted to force an end to it. But it seems to me that the pathology in uh, in war powers is actually that you want to have an advance approval uh, from Congress. Um, and uh, th this the the amendment that I'm proposing is not getting at any kind of advance approval. I think the pr problem with war powers is you get a lot of momentum behind military action once it starts happening, uh, and then it's difficult to check. And war powers is one of these things where really um, you, uniquely you need to have the check uh, before it happens. And so I, I just think the tool. I, it's not that I um, I'm, I'm rejecting the idea that there's a there's a fix needed there. I just think the the tool that I have is is not the tool. Um, to hammer that particular problem with. Well, uh, I think that's all the time we have. So we'll take a 10 minute break and come back here. So please join me in, in uh, thanking our uh, panelists here.